All right, at this time, the Teague family are ready to take your kids, kindergarten through third grade. If you want to send them in that direction, please do so. And I like to say, since they have about a dozen of their own, they can take care of yours. So <laughs> send them in that direction. All right, this is kind of a weird Sunday, different sort of Sunday. Uh, I, I told you since we got some folks away and uh, the setup is sort of different. Verse comes to mind, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. And so one more verse that has lots to do with where we're going today. Uh, so since this is a different sort of day, uh, this is a different sort of message. We're going to do a little Bible study class. And so hope you have your Bibles, open your Bibles if you have them to Second Peter chapter 2. And uh, those who don't have your Bibles, if you have your Bible apps, we're going to go in some different directions today, and we're going to do Bible study, okay? Uh, it's needed every once in a while, but we're going to do some serious Bible study. To get us into this, I always like to try to transition with something that's relevant, something we've been going through, and of course, this being Veterans Day, uh, brought a story to mind, and it pertains to exactly what Peter is talking about in Second Peter 2. Uh, back in the days of World War II, as World War II was coming towards an end, and as the Allied troops were going through Belgium and heading towards Germany, there was a battle known as the Battle of the Bulge. It was happened in the winter of 44 and of 45. And it was during that time that Adolf Hitler realized that... Uh, there were some problems, and he was being challenged, and he needed to face up. One of the ways he decided, and it was, this was actually an operation that was his brainchild, but it was known as Operation Graf, or Operation Grief, G-R-I-E-F, Graf. Uh, but the, it was pretty basic, simple plan, and that was to collect a number of German troops who could speak English really well, to get them together and for months to train them up, to disguise them in allied American and British, for the most part, uniforms, to teach them the slang of the U.S., to teach them some trivia of the United States, and then to disperse them amongst the allied troops so that they could cause confusion and could destroy as best they could, in fact, not only to change road signs and direct people in different soldiers in different directions, but also to assassinate any leaders or military uh, commanders that they needed to as well. Well, the plan worked to some extent, but it was very interesting. Once it was discovered, the Americans came up with a way to find out if this was truly a, an American soldier or was it a false soldier, a, 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 a soldier in disguise. And so what the Americans did was they came up with all sorts of questions that Basically, only Americans would know, or at least those who really knew America would know. For instance, one of the questions when someone caught someone in an American uniform to see if they were one of us or not was, who is Mickey Mouse's girlfriend? Uh, another question would be to name a capital of a certain state. Another question might be to give us a score of a baseball game that had just been played recently or a football game. Uh, in fact, it got kind of interesting because what they found was they were capturing some Americans that were not Germans but just did not know the answers to some of those questions. And in fact, one of them was General Omar Bradley. He got stopped one time. He was one of the big wigs, needless to say, in World War II on our side. And he got stopped and uh, he was held at gunpoint, actually. And this uh, private, this army private, asked him a question. And the question was, name the capital of Illinois. And General Omar Bradley said correctly, Springfield. And the guy said, no, it's not. It's Chicago. <laughs> he peeled potatoes until the end of the war. <laughs> well, church, on this Sunday, when we honor those who have served and fought for this country, we have been reminded in this series that we too are at war. We too very much, church, are at war. As Christ followers and a part of the body of Christ, we are involved in a spiritual war between the forces of good and the forces of evil, and it's dangerous. And as such, we have an enemy who is real and active, and what he has done is his own version of Operation Graf. What he has done is he has enlisted an army 
an army of false prophets and false teachers who have been disguised to look like us, who have been trained to talk like us, and who have been slipped in amongst the ranks so that they can cause confusion and division and try as best they can to steal, kill, and destroy. Here's my proof. Last week as I was shaking hands with folks who left, there was a couple that came out and they told me about coming out of a church just recently, uh, a, a mainline denominational church that they attended. And they said that in that church, the pastor recently stood in the pulpit and told the congregation that Jesus Christ is not the only way to heaven. That's just one example of how the enemy has slipped in wearing the uniform of the army of God, using the language of the army we are a part of, church, but teaching lies that contradict this word and who he is. And what we're doing is the, in this series, what, what we're trying to do is to share the truth so that when you come up against a counterfeit, you know it. When you hear a false teaching, you know it, all right? So over the last three weeks, we've looked at how to recognize a false teacher, a false prophet. We've gone through that. We've looked at Satan's plan of action and what he's up to. This week and next week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at God's plan, his plan of operation and what God is about. And I'm going to take you through this Bible study very, very quickly. We're going to cover a lot of points. I'm going to offer more information, hopefully online and some other direction there. But what I want to do is so that you don't have to guess at God's plan, you've got a little sermon outline on your bulletin. It's not going to be a lot of help, but it'll give you some space to write. But let's go through God's plan of action and where you and I come in. All right? Then what we're going to do at the end is the so what. When I lead a Bible study for the police department every, every Tuesday, I always like to end it by saying, so what? What does it do, have to do with you and me, and, and how does it apply? So we'll do the so what in just a few moments as well. But first, let's look at where God's going with his plan. First, we have a promise of God's judgment. All right, we come back to 2 Peter chapter 2 class that has been our springboard for this. And we're going to look at these same verses, but in a little bit different way. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter writes, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there were, will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. That's what I want you to see, that last phrase, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Uh, let's add another verse to it, and that's verse 3, and a part of verse 3, the last part of verse 3, where he says, in fact, let's just read the whole verse. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up, and here you go. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. All right, here's the point in this. There are many times when something terrible is happening in our lives, or in the life of this world, or the mess that's going on, there's something that somebody's going through, and we look at the news or we look at these situations and we say, okay, God, when are you going to step in? When are you going to do something about it? When are you going to stop this mess from happening? And there are many times that many in this world, including us sometimes, will think this, God, you must be sleeping. God, you must not care. God, you must have other things in mind because it just keeps on going and going and going. And we have to come back to that point that God says in his word, my ways are not your ways, my plans are not your plans. In other words, he does have a mission. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But what we need to know in this promise of a coming judgment is that our God does not sleep nor slumber. He does not sit idly by watching things progress or evil grow and say, I will do nothing about it. He does have a moment and a time when he will. He's about to show us. He's about to show us several instances when he did, and he's about to let us know he's about to do that again. All right? And so we come next. We moved through that, didn't we, very quickly? The promise of God's judgment. Now, I want to I land on the precedent of God's judgment or pictures of God's judgment, if you would. Uh, we're not even going to get to the third point because this is where we're going to end today. Some of you are saying, oh, this is going to be good. No, you just wait, okay? This is, I got to say this, Bible, this is Bible study class. This is Bible study that we're doing today. A little less preaching, a little more Bible study. And this is a lot 
a lot of information and a lot of subject that many churches and many pastors don't want to tackle. And i got to confess to you, I didn't want to tackle it for a long time. I didn't want to look at the fact that God was really this God of judgment as well as a God of grace for a long time. But my skin got a little bit thicker and I started learning more of the truth and so we started going in this place. And what I started to learn is that there will be a time when those who have wandered from God's way, those who have rebelled, those who have been false teachers will come to a time and their sentence has already been pretty much filled out on the paperwork. Uh, maybe they haven't, it hasn't totally been completed, but it's been filled out and the sentence is guilty. They're going to pay for it. And so what Peter wants to show us is that our God doesn't sleep because there were some other instances where people wondered, God, are you ever going to come in and do something about it? And God says, I am. So he gives us several pictures here, okay, several pictures. Uh, a lot of, again, a lot of folks would think as they look at these pictures that our God is not a God who would ever send anyone to hell. Our God is not one who would, would, would really worry about sin in the world. You know, a lot of people do think that. There are plenty of folks in the church today who, who don't believe God would send anyone to a place separating them from him forever. Or surely he's going to sweep all our mess under the rug and he's going to forget about it. I mean, there is this universalist thought that once we all get to heaven, God's going to say, I'm just, I was just kidding, everybody's in. Everybody's in. But the fact is, God is not going to do that because God is a God of truth. Number one, fact number one is God doesn't send anyone to hell. Did you hear that? God does not send anyone to hell. He simply allows a person to receive the consequence of their own choice. And he's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. Basically what he says is, in the end, if you've made your choice, I'll not change it. I'll not change it, but you will pay the consequences for that choice. Neither will he sweep any unforgiven sin under the rug and ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist. That's what we do. That's what you and I do, all right, especially with our own. So Peter gives these three illustrations of judgment that has happened and judgment that can happen again in this sort of way. And so I want to take you through these, this, this little Bible study here as we move from verse 4 down. All right, he gives us three pictures, and the first one is interesting. It has to do with fallen angels. How many of you have ever heard of fallen angels? And I'm not talking about television shows and miniseries, okay? Uh, I'm talking about the real stuff, fallen angels. Look at verse 4, and this is sort of mysterious, I guarantee you. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. Now, I know this is going to just tear some of you up, but we're stopping mid-sentence right there. For if, for if, that's interesting. For if, what you do is you start the thought right here. If you look down at verse 9, you find the conclusion of that for if. You'll find Peter concluding that verse. But in between, he gives us these three pictures of what he's talking about. Now, we don't know all the details about fallen angels. I know a lot of people have filled in the books. You know, they've tried to fill in the lines with this. They've tried to add books to it so that they can fill in the lines, all right? Add things outside of the truth, add things outside of, uh, of, um, of the Bible, out of Scripture. But we don't know a lot about it, but what we do know, we can piece from Scripture, and that gives us an idea of what these fallen angels are, are all about. The number one fallen angel was Satan, the devil, Lucifer, all right? Now, to find out his origin in order to get into all the other fallen angels all you got to do is put together some of the scriptures and what these scriptures have in mind class is prophecy was written with a dual reference or a dual purpose okay in that prophecy like Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah were written with messages to the people living then about certain people living then but it was also written for a message for us today are about something that's going to happen in the future. So God's word is, is mysterious like that. It's, it's like, okay, he's writing, he's giving us a parable or illustration. This happens for this people in this time, but it's also going to happen. You better watch out because the same thing can happen and will happen here, okay? He gives us these two instances in Isaiah, and I didn't write these down for you, but Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Those passages actually give us the origin of Satan, and how he came to be. Isaiah 14 verses 12 through 15. And then Ezekiel 28 
verses 12 through 17. Some of you are writing, so let me give that to you again. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15, and Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 17. And what you find as you piece these together are several things about Satan and how he started. He started as a created angel of God, just like all the others. But Satan had a rank which was above a lot of the angels. In fact, what you find in Scripture is the angels are not like equal angels. They are ranked, okay? There are different rankings, like an army almost. And so you have these archangels. And uh, Satan was not only an archangel, but he was also almost a super angel, if you would. And so what he did, as we gather from these Scriptures, is that he watched what was going on around the throne of God. He saw the worship that was being given to God Almighty, and what Satan started to do was desire it for himself, which leads us to believe and to know that just as you and I have been given a free will of choice, the angels were also given that free will of choice. And so Satan decides he's going to lead a rebellion. And so he leads this rebellion, and uh, it's interesting because everybody wants to know, okay, who rebelled with him? I mean, who, rebel, who would rebel with him? Well, believe it or not, a number of angels would. In fact, you're in 2 Peter chapter 2 right now. Go over to that last book. Everybody likes Revelation with regards to this. And Revelation gives us some information in chapter 12 about Satan and who went with him. All right, here's a little bit of dual reference here. Something that happened in the past, but something that foretells what's going to happen in the future as well. Uh, chapter 12, Revelation, verse 7 and following. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Okay, here, here, we got to stop here for a second. We got, let's, 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 let's part the ways between truth and false teaching. Jehovah's Witness comes to your door. They're going to knock on your door and they're going to tell you about Jesus. They also have another name for Jesus. His name's Michael. They associate the two. They think the two are one, Michael and Jesus, all right? So that when Scripture says Michael, it's talking about Jesus and vice versa. Case in point, you can come up, and we can do this later, but you can point to a lot of Scripture that says, no, Michael is not Jesus. Uh, Michael is an angel, all right? He's one of the ranking angels, and so he leads the angels on the good side. They fight against the dragon. Who's the dragon, class? All right, you're, you're here. Satan, uh, the devil, Lucifer. So he leaves this dragon, and the dragon and his angels fight back. But he's not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. All right, this is the fall. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth, and his angels with him. All right, question comes up. How many angels were with him at that point? Well, turn back to chapter 12. Of course, you're in chapter 12, Revelation. Go to verse 4, and you're 3 and 4, and you'll see the answer to this about how many angels. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven horns on his head. Again, picture of Satan at this point. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. Stars, that's a code word for angels, for angels, okay? So his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. All right, in the span of the last four minutes, you have had the origins of Satan, and you have also had the reasons he fell, and how many and who he took with him. A third of the angels. Now still, that's a countless number. But again, those are the ones who, who are, are, are kicked out of, of heaven. Now, where do they go? Where do they go when they get kicked out of heaven? We'll come back to Second Peter chapter 4 now. More Bible study. You, you, you're with me. I know this is light stuff. This is easy stuff. Yeah, sure. All right. Chapter 4 again. Where we see that they're sent to hell. All right. They're sent to hell. Now, interesting thing about this is not all of the angels are sent to hell. Now, again, I read through commentary after commentary of people who are a lot smarter than I am on this subject who have dealt with this, who have done it for years and years and a lot of them all their lives. And basically what they're saying is just as the angels have been ranked, then some of those ranking angels who rebelled ended up in hell in chains forever, or or at least for a a good portion of time until we have the end times, okay? They're sent to hell. Now, Now, I want you to stop here for a second, class, okay? Here's the deal. When Peter talks about the word hell, it's the word tartartus, okay, tartartus. 
It was a Roman word. It was a Greek word out of Greek mythology and basically it meant the underworld. It was, a, it was almost a holding place. It was still a place of punishment. It was still a place of prison, a dungeon, so to speak. It was a pit or an abyss, okay? But it's, it's, it's not the final form. When Jesus speaks of hell, he calls it Gehenna. And Gehenna is that final form of hell, okay? So there's this hell which is sort of uh, up here, but there's an a, a even worse place, the, the, the final place where they're going. So a few of them, stick with me here, a few of them end up, uh, or many of them end up in this, in this abyss or, or pit, if you would, and they're chained there. And then where do the others go? Well, it's interesting. The others are fallen angels, but we've given them other names. Uh, scripture has given us another name. What's another name for a fallen angel? Demon, a demon, okay? And so, again, for some reason, demons, certain demons, some demons have been allowed to roam the earth to be sort of Satan's minions, if you would, with regards to what goes on around here and evil. Now, th yeah, this is heavy stuff. This is weird stuff. But, uh, and again, culture takes it one direction. Scripture takes it in, in another direction. But, uh, again, we've gotten into a point where there are those in the church who say, well, Demons are, you've gotten a certain group who say demons are just mythology. They never really existed. You've got another group who say demons existed, but basically Jesus dealt with all of them and they're gone now. All right? But you've got reality that lets us know demons have not left the earth. Not yet. They have been cast. Even Jesus cast them into other places. But they're still allowed to roam. Why? That's a great question. We'll ask God when we get there one day. It's his plan, it's his reasoning. But you might remember Jesus is walking one day and he goes beside of this cemetery and this guy just comes up. In fact, Scripture says two guys come up and they are naked. They've been in that cemetery and they have demons amongst them. And the demons are not just one or two, but they said, my name is Legion because we are many. And so Jesus encounters these demons, but it's interesting. I always wondered about this. Before Jesus gets to the guys with the demons, the demons see Jesus coming down the road. And they holler out at Jesus, what do you want with us, son of God? Now, this is interesting. Remember last week we said, even the demons believe in God. All right? What separates them from us is obedience, is commitment to the Lord. All right? So, you got them saying to Jesus, what do you want with us, son of God? And then, then they say this, have you come here to torture us before our appointed time? What in the world is that all about? Before our appointed time. Well, when you tie in what you have just learned, you realize that in the end, these demons are going to be cast into the pit as well. In fact, Luke chapter 8 says, it says that these demons beg Jesus not to throw them into the abyss, into the pit, all right? You see, these de demons know their time is short. They know their time is short. As evil as they are, they realize God can step in at any moment and stop them. And they know that. And that's why they said, Jesus, don't. And so what did Jesus do? He threw them into some pigs. And the pigs go off the cliff. It's a neat story. You ought to read it for yourself, just not right before bedtime. Or anyway, but, you know. <laughs> now, now. Who are the ones who survive? This is what Peter's wanting us to get to. Okay, fallen angels, they're judged. Who are the angels that survive? The righteous angels. The many right, two-thirds of God's army are the righteous angels. First picture, keep that in mind. Let's go to the second picture quickly. He gives us the picture of Noah and the flood. Verse 5, again, he says, if, we start in mid-sentence sort of, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness and seven others, stop, mid-sentence. Okay, we all know the picture of Noah. Most of us know the picture of Noah. Bad times, right? Terrible wickedness going on. So much so that God said he looked into the minds of the people and he could see their thoughts were on evil all the time. I mean, I'm looking out at you and you look good today, but the fact is you and I have evil thoughts once in a while. We'll have an evil thought. I should do this. I can say this. I can, should, I can look at this. I ought to do this. You, but hopefully as a believer, that evil thought comes and goes. God had come to a point where he's just looking down on mankind and he's saying, 
they are thinking continue. They're, they're not coming to a point where they say, I shouldn't be thinking about it. I shouldn't be doing that. They're, they're just going for it. And God, this God who has all the patience in the world, comes to a point where he is just fed up. He's completely fed up with them. And it's interesting that at, at this point that the Bible says that God didn't give up on creation just like that. You know, the flood wasn't some knee-jerk reaction that God had just to get rid of all the mess in the world. In fact, before Noah, there was this guy named Enoch. And scriptures tell us that Enoch went about preaching against false teachers. They didn't listen to him. And then along comes Noah. Noah preaches before the ark ever sails. Noah preaches for 120 years. God says, you're going to be my spokesman. I want you to go around in this messy world and you tell them about me and about my love. And and they, they need to change. And in 120 years, no one ever came to the front. (laughs) You know, if I was Noah, I would have stopped after 75 years or something. I won't give up on you, okay? But Noah goes for 120 years and no converts. Nobody says yes to Jesus, okay? Nobody comes to the front. Nobody nobody buys into what... Maybe they saw this, this guy building a huge, giant box out in the backyard and there's no water around and he's calling it a ship and so they they just think he's a nut so they didn't buy into that but whatever the case we know that the flood came and the only ones who survived are Noah and his family scripture says the righteous ones okay get this now first picture fallen angels who survives the righteous angels second picture is the sinful world is destroyed who survives the righteous family okay We go to the third picture, and this is easy to explain, the picture of Sodom and Gomorrah. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. He continues, If he, if God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, and then in parentheses, verse 8, For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. We'll explain that one in just a second. But here's the point. Lot, Abraham's nephew. Abram and Lot come to this area and they look out and Abraham says, Nephew, I'm going to allow you to choose where you take your family and settle. And I'll go the opposite direction. And so Lot looks over at this area, and it is lush, and it's green, and it's fertile, and it's beautiful, and it's not like a desert where Abraham is going toward. And, and he says, I'll take that. And so he heads over, and he sets his family right at the edge, outskirts of Sodom. And Sodom grows with its evilness and surrounds him, and so he finds himself in that town of Sodom. And God takes all he can take out of these wicked people, these filthy people as Scripture actually, the lawless and filthy people they're described as. And in Genesis 13 and 14, or 18, what you read is that God came to the point where he says, I am ready to deal with these people. So he sends two angels. And these angels go to Abraham. They do a little negotiation with Abraham. You know, Abraham says, if, I, if you find 50 righteous people, will you destroy? And he goes on through that. They end up going to Sodom, the two angels. They get there at nighttime. Interesting story. They get there at nighttime. Lot comes out to meet them. Lot recognizes that they've been sent by God and and realizes, hey, these are strangers in town, basically, even before he realizes they're angels or they're, they're sent by God. And he says, hey, staying outside in this square is not a safe place. These people are just pure evil here. You come to my house. He takes the guys into his house. He hides them in his house, but the town people find out. And it's sort of like a riot, okay? And so they riot. These men come against Lot's house. They're banging on the doors. Let us in. Let us in. Basically, they're also saying, throw those men out so that we can have sexual relations with them, all right? And so they're banging on them, and Lot says, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm protecting you. Now, Lot's not a perfect man because you read the story and what Lot says is, no, how about taking my daughters instead? Now, that guy who's had some problems, you know, he's not a perfect man there. But, but God's looking at another direction here. So, end of the story, the next morning or even before the morning, what, what, what does God do? He saves Lot and his family. Uh, they are, the angels take them out of town. They're walking up the hill and all are saved except for Lot's wife. She's assaulted. But anyway, (laughs) okay, I just want to see how many of you are with you. Some of you are saying, what? (laughs) Yeah, that's not bad. It took me like three minutes to come up with that this week. But anyway, (laughs) it's just the way the mind went. 
doll. Anyway, so, so, uh, so light saved. But okay, here we go. Picture again. Fallen angels, who saved? Righteous angels. Fallen world, who saved? The righteous family of Noah. Fallen cities, who saved? The righteous family of Lot. Okay, we've got something we're tying in class together. It's a point we've got to recognize. Brings us to verse 9. Okay, already we had for if, beginning of verse 4, we get to verse 9, and it says this. If this is so, if God did not spare all, you know, if God did not spare the sinful angels, if God did not spare the sinful world, if God did not spare the sinful cities, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. In other words, God knows what he's doing, church. He knows what he's doing even when we sit back and say, God, why did you let this happen? Why, why, did, why did you not stop this from happening? Why did you not? And then he says in verse 10, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires, those false teachers of the sinful nature and despise authority. In other words, class, here's, here's it, here it is. Do you really think if God judged all of these for their sinfulness that he's going to let this sinfulness slide? The false teachers, the false prophets, and those who rebel and follow. Do you really think they're going to get away with it? Do you really think God's going to turn his back and act like he's sleeping and not even noticing? And the answer is, of course, no. A resounding no. These people will not get away from it. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, and this is interesting, he says about people like this, he says, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. It will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town or for those people who turn away from me, basically. All right, it's mighty quiet in here, and it's time to go. Been pretty hard-hitting. It's a hard-hitting study today, but there's a reason for this. And that is that God wants us to come to a point where we look at sin the way these righteous folks looked at sin in their time, that we can't stand it. And that's what it means when you go back to Lot's, that verse 8, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul. Lot was not a perfect person. But what God loved about Lot was that he looked at the sin of the world and he said, I can't stand it. I hate what this culture has come to. I hate where it's going. I hate what people are buying into and I will not fall for that. And so God said he, he counted him as righteous because of that. Church, that's where he wants us. He wants us looking at culture today and saying, culture may be going in this direction. They may be saying this about where we should do, what we should believe, where we could go, whatever. And God wants us to say, no, I hate what you're doing. I hate how you're twisting God's word. I hate how you're redefining what God has already put down as truth. I hate it. A lot of churches and a lot of Christians have their heads in the sand when it comes to these things. They don't want to talk about them. They don't want to face the fact or believe that not everyone's going to heaven. Or that millions of people are following false teachers and doctrines. They don't want to think that God really judges and punishes those who choose not to believe. But I've got to. Because believe it or not, God's judgment gives me hope. Now that's weird, isn't it? But I want you to hear this. God's judgment gives me hope. Why, David, can God's judgment? Because here's the deal. The truth is, God is serious about this because he's a God of truth. Because he is a God that will not turn his head when something wrong happens. Because he's a God that does not want us to misrepresent him or who he is or what he says. And we've seen he's not going to take it lightly. So why is this hope, David? Here's why it's hope. Because as messy as it still is, I know who holds this messy world. As messy as my situation is, I still hold, know who holds my messy situation. One week ago, today, just a few minutes ago, some madman filled with evil walks into a church and takes down, mows down 27 members and then wounds 20 more, leaving only five who wasn't touched by a bullet in that whole church down in Texas. A madman. 
And I look at that situation, I say, Lord, why didn't you stop the man with the trigger? Why didn't you stop him? Why didn't you end it all? Why, what was the purpose of all that? And then I go back on, on Monday, or earlier Tuesday, I think it was, and I looked at this church records, video records their church services. And I watched the service from two weeks ago. And this pastor who gets up, and I've already seen the faces. I've, I've seen the faces of those who died, and I'm watching this little church, and I'm watching them during a meet and greet. And they're walking around, the kids, the pastors, the associate pastor who was killed, and I'm looking at them, and I'm saying, that one, and that one, and that one. And I'm thinking to myself, they only have a week to live. They don't, they don't even know it. They only have a week to live. The pastor got up in the pulpit that day. You can go back and read this for yourself. He's got a motorcycle sitting in the front of the altar because they, he was talking about uh, the church reaching out to the lost and reaching those who we would not consider reaching, all right? And he talks about the church needing to be prepared. And he talks about, it's like prophecy, just over and over in what he's saying during that 45-minute message. He's talking about the church needing to be prepared, needing to know Jesus, needing to know that they're sure so when the time comes, and you're thinking to yourself, dual purpose, dual reference. He's talking to them today about something that's getting ready to happen a week ago or a week later and making sure they're ready. And then I got through watching that service. The tears were flowing. And I watched the pastor and his wife give a news conference on the Monday after they had lost their 14-year-old daughter in that tragic horrible situation they were away the associate pastor was there he was one who was killed their daughter was killed and I listened to and probably some of you heard the same words and they go through and and the mother reads that statement and says you know one thing that we find hope in we find hope in knowing that our daughter died with those she fiercely loved and they were holding her just as she was holding them she said and then the pastor comes on, and he says, he gives his little thing with regards to, hey, we're hurting, pray for us. And he says, you know what? Here's what I want to leave you with. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Where is hope in the midst of judgment? Here's my hope. It's knowing that evil will be judged for its evilness. It will be judged it will not go unattended. And then secondly, the righteous will have the final victory. The righteous will have the final victory because the thing is, that atheist, when he closed his eyes in death, that moment later, the next moment, he became a believer, but it was too late. He saw the face of God. The good news is that the moment those 27 closed their eyes in death in that horrible situation, they woke up to glory which is greater than you and I can ever imagine. And that's where they are. You know, following Jesus, there's no guarantee that someone is not going to put a gun to your head and ask if you know God or not. I'm thankful for a security team in this place. I'm thankful for guys who roam this place while you're sitting here. I'm thankful for a guy back in a room who watches a camera and all the cameras in this place to see what's going on around us. I'm thankful for these folks who, I'm thankful for one who's sitting back there right now every Sunday in uniform, one of our local police, and several others who do the same thing when you're around. I'm thankful for that. But you know what? That's no guarantee we're not going to be persecuted or tortured or killed for our faith. And that's not a guarantee. Following Jesus doesn't get you out of being ridiculed or humiliated. It's not going to get you out of that. But what it is guarantee you is that in the end, you win. In the end, you win. And here's the truth. What this means for believers who are going through trials and facing challenges where it's, Satan is trying to steal, kill, or destroy something in your life, it means Satan can't steal, kill, or destroy anything that doesn't belong to him. And if you're holding to him, he's got you in his hand. So don't fear. My hope comes from something this world can't give me. And I hope yours does too. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, an awesome God, this is hard-hitting stuff. This is this not easy. It's not one of those things where people go out and say, great sermon, great sermon, great sermon. You know, not for the reasons we're thinking. Father, we're talking about fallen angels and demons and hell. 
talking about truth that really you talked about as well. You didn't shy away from it. And Father, we'll not shy away from it. Some of us are just playing catch up with some of this, but Lord, we know it's true and we know it's real and we know it has to be shared because there is a world out there who's playing around with religion, playing around with the things of the faith, and they're following a lot of different directions that are not leading to heaven at all, but to the other place instead. And so, Father, our challenge is we want to share the truth in such a way that as many as possible can turn from that direction towards hell, towards heaven. We want to help you do that, Lord, in this place and outside these walls. And so, Lord, would you challenge this church and each of us who've learned the truth to go out these doors and share it with a world that doesn't believe or finds it hard? Will you help us, Lord, to look even in our situations where we have done some losing? There are folks in this room who have lost loved ones. There are folks in this room who have lost relations, spouses. There are folks in this room, Lord, who have gone through terrible times and they wonder health-wise or financially-wise or relationally. It, are things ever going to get better? What, why isn't God stopping this? Well, Lord, your timing is your timing. Help us to know that you will not sleep nor slumber. But when you're ready to move, you will move, and it will be right in every way. And so, Lord, we love you, even when it's hard to follow. If there's anyone in this room right now, Lord, who wants to know how they can be held by your hand firmly, you just let them know, Lord, all they've got to do is say yes to you and commit themselves to you. We want more in this family, Lord. And if there's anyone who does not have that personal relationship right now with you, let them open themselves up to you as Lord and Savior and believe that you love them so much you went to a cross for them. And then when they join in, the big adventure begins. We praise you, Lord, for the fun we'll have in a little while, but we also know there's truth to be had and meat to be chewed on. So... Let us go from this place in your glory and in that grace. And all of God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me?